grateful this morning? Are you grateful this morning? It is it's crazy that sometimes we take God's grace for granted. Yeah. God has been so good to us. And all we got to do is say thank you. We should be grateful that he woke us up this morning. This is yeah. one uh, that didn't make it this morning. We should be grateful that we still are in our right mind. There's some folks that don't even know their name. Amen. We should be grateful that we can look over and see family and friends that are still doing well, still got their health. Amen. We should be grateful that we still got a roof over our head. Some folks in this room know how it is to live out in your car. Amen. We have a lot to be grateful. It's a call from our heart that we are grateful for what God has done. For what he has done. Not ourselves, not anybody else, but what God has done. I'm grateful. Grateful. I'm grateful. Grateful. Flowing from my heart. Flowing from my heart. I'm grateful. Yeah. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Flowing from my heart. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Flowing from my heart. Flowing from my heart. God, we come right now and we are grateful. God, when we think about your goodness and your mercy and your grace toward us, our hearts should overflow with gratitude. Because God, you didn't love us because we were so wonderful or great. But you loved us because of your grace. And God, because of your grace, God, we experience your blessings. So God, we come right now with humble hearts and humble minds asking that you would speak to our hearts today. God, some of us have had, uh, had a rough week. Some of us had a challenging morning. And God, we need to hear you today. So God, we ask right now that you would open up our ears that we might hear. Open up our hearts that your word may be deposited deep inside us. To the end, God, that we might be changed. We pray today that a soul might be saved and a heart might be changed. We thank you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 you got to have a praise for his mercy and his grace. For his brethren, amen. Boy, Sly, you dug in there, boy. My goodness. goodness. God is good. Amen. God is good. Turn your Bibles with me or your electronic device to 1 Peter. We are still hanging out in 1 Peter, and we're so glad that you are here on this morning as we continue our journey through uh, our Bible series, Hope and Glory. Man in First Peter. So turn to First Peter, uh, chapter three, and I want to express my gratitude uh, to the husbands and wives from last week that you know I was able to leave church in relative safety. Amen. I know last week was a little rough as we learned our our roles in Christian marriage. Amen. I was a little nervous, but you guys were were gracious. Amen. So we're going to focus our attention today on verses 8 through 12. And the word of God reads as such. It says this, Now finally, all of you should be like-minded and sympathetic, should love believers and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing. Since you were called for this, so that you can inherit a blessing. For the one who wants to love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. 
And he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their requests. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. If you need a subject for today as we continue our series, Hope and Glory, the subject today is cultivating Christian conduct. Cultivating Christian conduct. I know that doesn't sound all sensational and all exciting, amen? Uh, but the Word of God has something to teach us on today. Listen, here in this section of Scripture, the Apostle Peter provides a summary statement. He says, first, now finally all of you. Listen, throughout the last few weeks, we have taken a look at Peter's admonition to submit to authority. We learn to submit to authority because it's commanded. Right. And we also learn that we have to submit because we are free in Christ to do it. Amen. We have freedom. We learned on last week when it was a little rough for a brother yeah. <laughs> to, to know our roles. Amen. To know our roles. And, and in knowing our roles, we have to come to understand that uh, the role of a Christian wife is to submit to her husband's authority. Because it is commanded. I know I'm some on dangerous ground, but we're going to go here for a minute. It serves as a witness to God's power, and it reflects her inner beauty. And then we didn't let the husbands off the hook because the scripture does it. And a husband's role is to provide consideration and care for his wife. Now, Peter gives us some all-inclusive instructions in these verses on Christian conduct. Again, Peter is writing to believers who are under intense persecution from the Roman Empire. They are uh, uh, being persecuted simply because they love Jesus and they're not afraid to talk about it. See, these believers were being challenged. Their faith were being challenged. And it is in this setting that Peter encourages believers to cultivate their Christian conduct. They are to cultivate this Christian conduct at a time when people are trying to take their heads off, right. when people are trying to burn them at the stake, when people are taking their property, placing them into slavery, when they're under intense persecution, Peter writes that you need to work on your conduct. Mm. If there's anything I want you to remember today, if there's one point I want you to take home today is that Christian conduct is cultivated in the context of of community and care. Christian conduct is cultivated, right, in community and care. It's, it's that context that we have to cultivate our conduct, our behavior. Christian conduct has to do with how we live out our faith. We learn that our faith should reflect our relationship with Christ. It is a shame that many believers today in the church do damage to the church by the way we conduct ourselves. We say we love Jesus. We, we got crosses on. Amen. We got all the, the nice little sayings on our t-shirts and everything. Amen. We got bumper stickers on our cars and all kind of stuff, but we act a fool. See, our conduct should reflect our relationship. See, how you live your life should reflect who you love. If we love God, it should be apparent in how we live. In our culture, we have, a, we have smartphones to help us to, to keep our busy schedules in order. Amen? Uh, you know, we up in the morning, work out, get ready for work, drop the kids off, off to work, after work, pick the kids up, grab something to eat, homework, off to practice, recital, tutoring, game, or something. And home, eat again, catch up on scandal or empire, praying for you, shower, <laughs> uh, maybe a little fun for the married folks, sleep, and then tomorrow the cycle starts again. And let's not even get to the weekend, because the weekend, is that really time off? Our weekends are more crowded than our weekdays. When we look at our busyness, where is the time to cultivate 
our Christian conduct? Where is the time to cultivate our relationship with Jesus Christ? See, my point is that there is none. Because for many of us, our Christian lives are more spiritual status symbols than an actual lifestyle. See, cultivation takes time. Let's define some terms. To cultivate Christian conduct, you have to be willing to make the things of God your priority, not an afterthought. See, to cultivate is an agricultural term. It is to prepare the soil for planting. So to cultivate in this context means to improve or develop something by careful attention, training, or study. So to cultivate a Christian conduct takes careful attention, training, and study. It takes time, and it takes action. See, we can't just squeeze the things of God into our busy schedule. God has to be our our priority. See, Christian conduct is cultivated in the context, the surrounding of community and care. The first thing that we learn here in our verses that we go over in 1 Peter chapter 3 is that Peter points out that it is Christian conduct is cultivated in the conduct and the context of community. He says this, now finally all of you should be like-minded. Like-minded. Uh, I love the whispers. <laughs> them, them little brothers from Watts, I tell you, boy, uh, Scotty and crew, they do their thing. Amen? Amen. But and, and I've seen them in concert uh, uh, many a times. But one thing that strikes me is that they are always in harmony. Amen? Amen. They are always in harmony. Brothers, y'all did a good job. I'm working on y'all harmony, amen? I would join y'all, but that would break your harmony, amen? So here the scripture is telling us that we are to be harmonious or live in harmony. This translates, this word or this phrase translates a single word in the original language, and it means to be like-minded. It describes an inner unity of attitude that makes division and mutiny in the church within this body of Christ, almost unthinkable. We are to be of one mind. Listen, this does not mean that the church will never have a difference of opinion. With the variety of gifts and talents God has given his people, it means that differences of opinion are going to happen. But it means that we are working toward the same goal. Listen, we are unified because we serve the same God. We are unified because we have the same purpose to fulfill the mandate that he has given us. He has given us, like the body is, one, amen, but with many members, we as the body of Christ are to be unified with many members doing their job. Amen? We are to be like-minded, unified. We don't. It doesn't mean that, that we can't be ourselves. That God has shaped you as you are. That doesn't mean you don't get a chance to, to, to express your unique personality. And some of us have some very unique personalities. <laughs> but it means that in the context of community, we are of one mind. Amen. As the scripture says, one mind, one love, one baptism, one God we serve. Amen. We are bound together. We are to live in harmony or in community. And this means that Christians, we should pursue the same primary purpose of serving God and extending love one to another. Amen? Instead of us being fueled by our individual and selfish interests, we need to be fueled by doing the things God has called us to. When I was young, my my brother used to have this flag football team in the early 70s called Unity. Amen? And I'm telling you, it was just about a ragtag bunch (laughs) I mean, you know, my brother's 67, so, man, yeah, he, they was pretty wild. They had cats from all, I mean, from the Afros to the Braves. They probably had a few killers on the team, amen, amen. If you rode on the bus with them, it was a nice uh, fog on the bus, and it wasn't because it was smoke coming from the engine. <laughs> but when they got on the football field, they worked as one unit. 
All this ragtag, crazy looking cats from all different walks of life with different kind of attitudes and behavior all worked together. Amen. To accomplish the goal on the football team. They were called unity because they were united in their efforts. Can we say that about our, uh, the church? Amen. Because we are a whole bunch of people from all kinds of different backgrounds, different talents, different gifts, different experiences. Amen. That God has brought us together and we are to work unified to accomplish the goal that God has set. Amen. The danger in the church, and I'm going to say this, is that many folks are looking for their own uh, self-interest. They're looking out for themselves instead of looking out for the things of God. When we talk about the Christian context, it is first God-centered and other-focused. We must make sure God is the priority. Listen to what it says in Philippians 2, 4, and 6. It says, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also look for the interests out for the interests of others. When we look at our life in Christ, it is to be other centered. The scripture says there that we are to put others' needs above our own. Listen, as believers, our conduct has to be in the context of community. Our conduct is to, to seek to do things that God has called us to do, to be in harmony with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a foster community. It is based on unity, and it, again, is other-centered. Yeah. Again, when we look at the church, we have to make sure our focus is on Christ and that we are unified in our efforts, that we have a unifying relationship because we hold Christ in common. It is the bond that all believers share and should serve as a connection point that unifies us, not divides us. We should be unified because I love Jesus, you love Jesus too. Amen. We should be unified because he called us to serve and to follow him. Listen to what Warren Willsby writes. He says, unity does not mean uniformity. It means cooperation in the midst of diversity. The members of the body work together in unity, even though they are different. Christians may differ on how things are to be done, but they must agree on what is to be done and why. Amen. We may uh, uh, have differences on how we kind of conduct our businesses, but, but we need to understand that the purpose is set by God. Amen. We do what we do because God has called us to do it. Amen? Amen? So the believer's conduct here is cultivated in the context of community. We are to be unified. We are to be one. We are to operate as one. But there can be no real community without care. It, and we can't operate in community without care. I can call uh, Deacon Villain my brother all day long, but if he don't think I care about him, <laughs> he is not going to really see me as his brother. Amen. And I know that uh, we often say uh, our families are a picture of what the church should be. And I agree because some of our families, we got some jacked up families. But let something happen to a family member. Amen. Let somebody talk about your, your sister or your brother. You'll be ready to fight. You'll forget all about how much money they owe you. <laughs> You'll forget all about how they wore your outfit and they did this and they did that. You mess with my brother, I got your back. You mess with my sister, I got your back. In the family of Christ, we need to show love. We need to show care and concern for those that God has placed us together in the body of Christ. It's done in the context of care. When I speak of care here, I'm speaking of, of care that is motivated and maintained by love. Listen here, in the latter part of verse 8 and part of verse 9, it says this, Now finally, all of you should be like-minded. It says, concentrate here, listen, and sympathetic. Should love believers and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called for this. 
so that you can inherit a blessing. See, the rest of verse 8 reflects on the active working elements of a harmonious group of people. Sympathy, compassion, and humility are all evidence of care. In these verses, he tells us to be compassionate. It simply means to be tender-hearted. It underlines the feeling that comes from, a, from deep inside a person, especially one who observes the suffering and pain that another person is enduring. We as believers are to be compassionate. It is scary how callous we become in the church. We become a reflection of what we see in the world. I know folks that are, are witness people get harmed and they don't even move them. Amen? We become callous. We need to be compassionate. That means tender-hearted. Your heart is tender toward those who've been hurt. When you see someone in pain, it should affect you if you love God. Yeah. It should affect you if the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you because God was tender-hearted toward you. He was tender-hearted toward you when he sent his son. Amen? Yeah. I think about the fact that God has called us to have hearts that are tender toward one another. We need to show compassion toward one another. In, in, in the account or the, the parable of the, of the Good Samaritan, uh, Jesus tells the story of, of the, the Samaritan who was, uh, the, I'm talking about the Jew who was injured and in the street. All the folk who were so sophisticated, you know, passed by. You have the temple worker pass by. You have the priest that pass by. Amen. But, but the, the hated Samaritan, the, the hated Samaritan sees a man in the street, battered and beaten, and his heart was compassionate. And he not only give compassion, because some of us would say, ooh, look at that poor man. He's beat, beat up and, and bloody. He's hurting. I'm going to pray for him. His compassion moved him to action. Amen? Amen? So not only should we be tender-hearted, but we should be moved to action. We should ask ourselves, believer, has your heart become hardened? Amen. Have the things of the world, has your, your, your trials and tribulations of life turned your heart to stone? If it has, God needs to tender you up, make you compassionate. Then he gives us a word that kind of goes with that. He says, be sympathetic. See, sympathetic goes beyond compassion in that it attaches actions to the tender heart. See, what the Good Samaritan did was not only be compassionate, but he was sympathetic in the fact that he took action. This word has a distinctly practical bit. Not only do believers understand the feelings of another, they act appropriately to assist that individual. Amen. See, not only are we to be compassionate, but we are to act out on that compassion and be sympathetic. If we look at Jesus as an example, he was not only compassionate to the people, he was sympathetic. He saw their plight and acted on it. Right, man. He saw their pain and acted on it. He showed them the love and care that comes along with knowing God. Sympa being sympathetic means that we must move beyond just recognizing that someone is hurt and someone is in pain, but that we must be called to act. Not only are we to be compassionate, be sympathetic, we're to be loving to God's people. I always thought this was interesting. We need to be loving to God's people. If you notice all throughout the scripture, God says, Jesus says this, he tells his disciples, they, they shall know you by the love you show one for another, he continues to remind the church to love one another. Evidently, there's a problem with love. <laughs> Evidently, we have an issue with loving one another. But he tells us that we must be careful to love God's people. Listen, in our time, in 1 Peter, it has been noted that love is a recurring theme in Peter's letters. Not only God's love for us, but also our love for others. Peter had to learn this important lesson himself. He had a hard time learning it. Amen? Peter was this 
com uh, this compulsive man who the same Peter is talking about learn to love one another, the same one who took the sword out and was ready to cut folk up. And the same Peter who had a problem with this. But he is telling us that we need to love. Listen to how patient Jesus had to be with Peter. He kept telling Peter how much he loved Peter. He had to encourage Peter in love. And think about how uh, patient he has been with us in displaying his love toward us. We should begin to show God's love by showing it to God's people. Just as the whole of law is summed up in love, so the whole of human relationships is fulfilled in love. This applies to every Christian in every area of life. He talked about the fact that Paul writes that you can, you can show all kind of things. You can exercise all kind of gifts. You can do all kind of stuff, but it, it is not done. With love, you're making a whole bunch of noise. Brothers, I love y'all with y'all Eastvale Bible shirts on and everything. You can be up here singing songs, amen. We can stand and clap and burn back lips, run around the building, amen. But if you don't do it motivated by love, you're just making a whole bunch of noise. We are to do it motivated by love. It is love that is the glue. We must be motivated by love in all areas of our life. There can be no community without care, and there can be no care without love. Right. He also tells us in the scripture an uh, 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 issue that we have. He says, be humble. You know, some of us in Christianity walk around with, with t-shirts and say, I'm humble. <laughs> you got to put a t-shirt on it. If you got to advertise it, you got to tell me you ain't humble. Right. Amen. <laughs> The scripture tells us that we are to be humble. Humility is an awareness of strengths and gifts as provided by God and, great, and a grateful attitude for them. It is an awareness of areas of weakness and need and a desire to grow in these areas and the willingness to receive assistance when these needs are there. Listen, humility does not mean that you are doormat. I love it. It, it is closely tied to the term uh, meekness. And my former pastor used to tell us that, that humility and meekness is strength grown tender. Listen, don't take a humble man as weak. If a humble man recognize he may be able to break your neck, but he's not going to do it because he loves God more. And he wants you to come to church to get to know the Jesus that's keeping him from breaking your neck. Amen. Humility is strength grown tender. It means that you understand who you are in Christ. You don't have to brag about it, amen. Not only that, that you understand your weaknesses. See, some of us, we, we don't want to recognize that there's some areas in our lives that we struggle. Paul, the great apostle, talks about the fact that he finds strength in his weakness. He calls himself the chief of all sinners. Paul, the most prolific writer in the New Testament, Paul, the one who Jesus uh, knocked off his high horse. Paul, this one who encourages us. Yeah, he says, listen, I got some areas in my life I struggle. But in those areas, I recognize that my struggle and God makes me strong. Listen, your area of weakness, God can take that area and make it a point that you can be able to encourage someone else. He can make that a point of strength. The very things that the enemy tells you are failures in your life, God can take those very points and make them triumphant in your testimony for somebody else. Don't be afraid to, to admit that you have a struggle in certain areas. Amen. Humble yourself before God. And at the right time, the scripture says, in due time, he will exalt you. You never have to pump yourself up in Christ. If you're doing the things God tells you to do, don't worry, he'll take care of you. Amen? Amen? We are to be humble. Humility is an attitude. And we must operate that, amen, in that attitude. Humility desires to put the interests of others ahead of our own self-interest. Humility says, I'm more than welcome to take a back seat and allow somebody else to shine. Not only that, he tells us that we're to be humble, but we're also to be merciful. Wow. It's just pause right there. Let that sink in. Be merciful. As Christians, we can live on one of three levels. We can return evil for good, which is the satanic level. 
We can return good for good and evil for evil. That's on a human level. Everybody do that. You're good to me, I'll be good to you. Stab me in the back, I got a knife too. <laughs> That's the human level. Or we can return good for evil, which is the divine level. Jesus is the perfect example of the divine level. <laughs> we being evil did not deserve his love. We all, uh, y'all, y'all know we all out of sin and falling short of the glory. Because I know some of y'all say we being evil, y'all look at me like, I ain't no been evil. <laughs> the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. Amen. Each of us need God's grace. So we being evil, God did not return evil for evil, but he sent his best. He didn't return his, his, his worst. He returned his best. He didn't repay our sinful attitudes, our sinful conduct, our sinful thoughts, our sinful actions with judgment. He returned it with giving his best who died on the cross for our sins, who gave his very life for us. See, that's the divine level, and he is calling us to do it. See, some of us, we love the Old Testament. When somebody done something to us. Many of us ain't even read the Old Testament. But we read the quote, eye for an eye, two for a two. Yeah, amen. You pop me, I'm popping you back. Hey, amen. We, we love the Old Testament. We're like, hey, where's that in the Bible? Uh, in Second Hezekiah? <laughs> Y'all get that later on. <laughs> hey, amen. We are to operate on the divine level. We are not to operate giving evil for evil. See, when we talk about uh, um, this, this divine level, it is a level that, that sees and operates on the basis of mercy. See, justice gives you what you deserve. Be careful. Don't ask God for justice in your life. Because justice gives us what we deserve. But mercy grants us what we don't deserve. Amen. When Christ went to the cross, we didn't deserve his mercy. Amen. But he gave it because he loved us. It was because of his grace. He freely gave it. He showed mercy. That's the divine level. Think about this. When Christ was on the cross and he looked at those who had helped put him there. Amen. He looked at those who had mocked him. He looked at those who had spit upon him. He looked at those who had beat him. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. See, they weren't worthy of his forgiveness. They didn't earn his forgiveness. They didn't go to church every Sunday. They didn't sing in the praise team. Amen. They didn't go to Bible study. They didn't do any. They didn't deserve it. He gave it freely. And he didn't wait for them to say, we you. He did it proactively, amen. God went to the cross for you before you even surrendered. That's the divine level that God has called us to. When the last time you showed somebody mercy? Ask yourself, when was the last time you operated on the divine level? Are you waiting for the folk to, to do something, then you go forgive them? You know, if they do this, then I'll give them mercy. You gotta be careful. What if God did you like that? Mm. What if God said, I'm waiting for you to clean up, then you can come. Wait for you to get your act together. See, we know if you love God and you know this Bible, you can't get your act together without Him. Amen? Amen. We got to understand that we must be merciful. When we look at this Christian call to conduct cultivated in the context of community and care, we must understand that God has called us to a higher level. We find that higher level in the challenge in verses 10 through 12. So how do we live out this Christian conduct? How do we cultivate it? What do we do to, to make sure that we are walking in line with what God has called us to do? Verse 10 says this, for the one who wants to love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil. Uh, go ahead, take your time, highlight that, underline it, circle it, block it, amen. Put some bells and whistles on it. And his lips from speaking deceit. And he must turn away from evil and do what is good. He must seek 
peace and pursue it because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their requests. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. Mm. Peter closes out this section on Christian conduct by quoting from Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. He said we should love one another, love our enemies, love life. See, the news of impending persecution should not cause a believer to give up on life. Listen, I got, I got stuff in my life. All of us got stuff in our lives. We got things that we're going through. Some stuff is dying. Amen. Some uh, um, in, in, in law enforcement vernacular, some stuff is code three. Amen. It's lights and sirens. We, I mean, it's emergency. Like God, we need you to step in, like right now. Some of us have some stuff been marinating for years. You know, it's just been coming. It just seems like it's that thing that just won't let you go. We, we got some stuff going on. But just because you got trials, just because you got tests. Just because you got some things you're going through does not mean that you don't have to love the life that God has given you. That doesn't mean that you can't embrace life and trust God to help you in your situation. Amen. Listen, what may appear to be bad days to the world can be good days for a Christian. If he will only, if we will only meet certain conditions. Listen, one commentator says these are the conditions and I want to share with you. He says the first thing we must deliberately decide to love life. It's right there in the scripture. He says for us to love life. This is, a, is an act of the will. It says he who lives, who wills to love life. It is an attitude of faith. You got to make a choice to live a life of faith. It is an act of will. The Christianity doesn't happen by osmosis. You don't just give your life to Christ and all of a sudden he just starts walking you around like a robot. You've got to surrender. You, you have to do an act of the will. Oh, just because you're a football player and you're on the team, you signed up, you got, a, you got pads and a uniform and cleats and they set you on the field. If you just stand there, what's going to happen? You're going to get hurt. Right. Right. I'm a football player. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> you you got to play the game. It's an act of the will. Some of us give our life to Christ and we think that's it. I got my ticket into heaven. I'm done. No, you have to actively decide to live this life. Yeah. Yeah. And best believe it's a life worth living. Listen, you must also control your tongue. We spent a series in James and we talked about the power of the tongue. Amen. World wars have been started with the mouth. Amen. Many an argument in the house has been started with the mouth. You need to control your tongue. It is a small member, but it can kick up a whole lot of dust. Amen. Uh, uh, can control your tongue, again, is an act of the will. God says you need to watch your mouth. Amen. What you say it cuts. That old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's the biggest lie ever been told. I'm hit me. Amen. <laughs> I'll recover. But some words we've been holding on to for 25, 30 years. Words that have cut deep and been painful. Believers, you got to watch our tongues. Watch what we say. Man, we have to control our tongues. Many problems of life are caused by the words that we say. The wrong words. Words spoken in the wrong spirit. Do you know you can say the right, or the, the right thing with the wrong motivation and cause damage? Amen. You can say the right thing with the wrong attitude. Amen. I almost said something. I'm going to keep that to myself. Amen. We got to watch our tongues. Every Christian should look at James chapter 3 and see what the word of God says about the tongue. We need to watch what we say on a regular basis. The word of God tells us in Ephesians 4.29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only words that are good for the moment, amen, that they may, listen, bring grace to those who hear. We need to bring, bring words that build up and encourage. Right. Words that, it doesn't mean that we don't call out stuff. Right. Amen. You know you can call out stuff in love. Right. You can call out stuff and, and do it the right way, but he's telling keep your tongue from evil. Right. Evil does damage. Right. Better watch what we say. Amen. 
Then he says this, we must do good and hate evil. Wow. Listen, we need both the positive and the negative. The old English word, askew, means more than just avoid. It means to avoid something because you despise and loathe it. It is not enough for us to avoid sin because sin is wrong. We ought to shun it because we hate it. See, many of us, we avoid sin. You know, we, we, we dodge it. But we still got a secret love affair with it. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, see, y'all don't understand. Right, right, right. You ain't calling that number in your phone no more. But it's still in the phone. You, 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 not, you may not be going to that particular area. Uh, but when you think about it, you still have a longing for it. Oh, y'all quiet now. <laughs> we have to grow to where we hate sin. God hates sin. He loathes sin. And we should hate it. The more you hate it, the less you'll do it. That's for free. Amen? Listen, we must do good and hate evil. We must act actively seek to do good. He says here, finally, we must seek and pursue peace. The scripture tells us, Jesus says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Matthew 5, 9. If we go out and seek trouble, we will find it. Listen, man. I, I'm going to tell you this. I ain't never had to really look for trouble. <laughs> I, I, ain't, I just had to be in the area. Matter of fact, I didn't have to look for it because I already knew where it was. Amen? Many of us, we don't have to look for trouble. But we, if you look for trouble, I guarantee you'll find it. Those who have been in uh, my Sunday school or any of my Bible study classes, I got a little saying. It's a short trip back to the ghetto. All you have to do is turn around. Because the ghetto ain't a location, it's a mindset. Amen? And for us as believers that our sinful nature is not just our actions, but our mindset. We need to pursue peace. We need to pursue those things that are peaceful, those things that are God. God is the Prince of Peace. So if we pursue the Prince of Peace, then we shall have peace. Listen, if we go after peace, we shall find peace in God. But let me give you this little caveat. This does not mean peace at any price. Because righteousness must always be the basis for peace. I, peace uh, the word peace means coming into agreement with another. Amen? Uh, I'm not going to come into agreement with those who don't, uh, that are evil. Amen? We, we got a lot of things that go on in the world. We want peace accords and all these type of things. No, I'm, I'm, not, make, I'm not seeking peace with the devil. You got some folks that are making their life seeking peace with the devil. No, no, no. I'm seeking peace with those who God has put in my life to seek peace. We should be operating and be peacemakers, but it's not peace at all costs. Amen? Because usually if you seek peace at all costs, it ends up costing you. Amen? So we are to seek peace. It says that we do all that we can to live at peace with everyone. That's Romans 12, 18. Sometimes it is not possible to do that. That's why Romans 14, 9 says this. For, so then we must pursue the things which make for peace and building up one another in peace. The scripture tells us also that as long as it depends on you, it is, it is you that are trying to make peace. If it is possible to make peace, we are to make peace. Amen. Christians of, of all people should be peacemakers, right. not peace breakers. Amen. Right. Peter quoted these statements from Psalm 34, 12 through 15, so it would be profitable for us to read the entire psalm. It describes what God means by good day. They're not necessarily days free from trouble, but the psalmist wrote about fears, he wrote about troubles, he wrote about afflictions, and he even wrote about a broken heart. Listen, for us as believers, our days are, uh, can sometimes be filled with trouble. They can be filled with heartache, 
But guess what? The God of peace gives us the strength to be able to still have joy in even some of the most worst and dire circumstances. It's been some times in my life that I've experienced some unspeakable joy. But if you looked at my circumstance, if you looked at my situation, if you looked at everything that was going on around me, you would ask yourself, how can you have joy? Because this world does not give me the joy. My circumstance does not dictate my joy. Hey, my joy comes from the Lord. Jesus said, but for the joy that was before him, before him was the cross, before him was a, 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 just a horrendous and a painful death that he had to die for us. But the joy was those that would experience the salvation of Jesus Christ through his sacrifice. So you may have trouble, but you still can have joy. Amen. 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 As I push to a close, listen to Psalm 34 as I just share a small piece of it. It says this, I'm starting at verse 17. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them from evil, from all their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in the spirit. Many adversities Come to the one who is righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Again, speaking of the son, evil things, death to the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. The Lord redeems the life of his servants, and all who take refuge in him will not be punished. We find peace. In him. We find joy in him. We find love in him. Psalm 46 uh, 1 tells us that he is our strength and our refuge, a very present help in our times of trouble. Listen, Christians, our conduct is to be cultivated in the context of community and care. We must be unified, and love must be. The thing that binds us together. Harmonious relationships within the church are a priority for us as believers. We need to seek to get along. Not just the right and the king can we just get along. We need to actively pursue harmony among believers. Listen, revengeful behavior and speech are not consistent with Christian testimony. We're not to take actions in our own hands. I got this. No, you don't have it. Amen. You don't you don't get to set down your religion. You know, I know y'all heard that when that's a good thing when Christians fight, you know. So I'm gonna set down my religion. How you do that? Hey, Amen. Do you ask the Holy Spirit, can you step out for a second? I just wanna No. If you truly love God, you can't set him down. Amen. We vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I shall repay. Listen, we must work diligently to promote harmony within the church. We must look for ways to demonstrate love, sympathy, and compassion to members of the body of Christ. And we must be aware that the power of what we say has damaging effects. <laughs> Cultivating Christian conduct takes time, right. takes action. Right. What are you doing to cultivate your relationship with God? Are you spending more time in your own garden? And then you're spending in the spiritual garden to cultivate your relationship with God? Is your relationship with Christ an afterthought? Or is it your priority? We must cultivate our Christian conduct that it might reflect our relationship with Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give God a hand of praise. Where I'm going, I've been crying at night.